Once upon a time, a man goes to the bar every night and he would order four drinks. Now the bartender got curious and eventually he asked him, Sir, why do you always order four drinks? And he said, oh, that's because there used to be four of us drinking buddies. But those three, Joe, Juan, and Zhang, got this crazy idea to take a long trip to a remote island. They've been gone for months now, and I miss them. So in honor of, my friend, of our friendship, and in honor of my friends, I would order one for me, and I would order three drinks for my friends. And so one drink is for me, and the three drinks are in, re in remembrance of my friends. Wow, that's sweet, man. You're an awesome friend, the bartender said. The next night, the man, as usual, went back to the bar, but this time he ordered only three drinks. The bartender said, oh, I'm sorry about your friend. What happened to him? Oh, no, 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 he said, my friends are all okay. I ordered only three drinks tonight because my doctor said to me today that I shouldn't be drinking anymore. That's why I am not drinking, only my friends are. Well, I think we are all good at finding excuses so we can do what we want to do, no matter what, don't we all? This morning, we are continuing our series on the study of Proverbs, and we want to discuss a sensitive issue today about wine. We want to answer a few questions, such as, is wine in the Bible alcoholic or juice? Are Christians allowed to drink? Can I drink as long as I don't get drunk? These questions are not that easy to answer. And so I hope that you would listen well to what the Bible has to say. What does the Bible have to say about wine? Now, before we dive in, we must first deal with an uncomfortable truth for some people. And that is that wine in the Bible is real wine, okay, not grape juice. How do we know that? Do you know Welch grape juice, the one we use often for our communion service? Welch grape juice, when was it invented? Do you know? It was invented in 1869 when the American physician and dentist Thomas Bramwell Welch found a method to pasteurize grape juice to keep it, to stop it from ferment, fermenting. You see, in Bible time, however, there was no such thing as non-alcoholic wine, aka grape juice. Once the grapes are crushed, once the grapes are pressed, the natural yeast press, that's present on the skin of the grape, once it's broken, immediately goes to work. Fermentation begins, turning sugar into alcohol. So both the new wine and the old wine, they are both fermented. Also, we realize, and you, if you read the Bible, that wine was just part of the common life, the, the everyday life. It was so common. Wine was used for payments, like in Ezra 3.7. Wine was used for healing, as we see in Luke 10.34. Wine is also used for stockpiling in preparations for war or maybe for pandemic in 2 Chronicles 11.11. 11. For all these purposes, you cannot use grape juice. They must be fermented wine. So maybe some will ask, so you mean Jesus used real wine to institute the communion? Jesus turned water into real wine? You mean God created something that can intoxicate people? Well, wine is actually not the issue. The main issue actually is the abuse of wine. Now, we'll, we'll get into detail soon, but for now, just think about it this way. The, it's the abuse of wine that's the problem. Just as abuse of food makes you a glutton, the abuse of wine makes you a drunkard. Remember Jesus turning, uh, I mean, he created bread unlimited bread for 5,000 men. Even though so much bread has the potential for gluttony, doesn't it? Or when Jesus made money appear in a fish mouth so that Peter can take it to pay taxes. Even though money, we know money, the love of money has the potential to make people greedy. Or the time when Jesus made Peter catch the biggest pile of fish in his whole fishing career. Even though overnight successes like this 
they have the potential to make someone materialistic. You see, wine in itself is amoral, meaning it's neither good nor bad. It's how we use it that matters. Now, I hope you don't stop here with the message because you say, okay, uh, pastor said wine is okay, so I can go and drink all I want. Because today we're going to look at some warnings from Proverbs that warns us against the danger of wine. You see, just like money or drugs or any other addiction, wine must be used very carefully. We must be wise in how we treat wine. We're going to look at three main passages in the book of Proverbs. And the first one is Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Here, it tells us that we must not be careless with wine. Do not be careless with wine. Proverbs 20, verse 1. It says, Wine is a mocker and beer a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. We must be careful. If we want to live wise life, we must be careful with wine. We must handle it with care. Just because Christians can drink is not a license for us to abuse it. You see, the dangers of alcohol, I think we all know, the dangers are, are so obvious. It's a mocker and a brawler. Many families, lives, and even dreams have been shattered when wine is abused. In the United States, according to statistics, listen to this, I was shocked myself, two out of three Americans will be involved in a drunk driving crash in their lifetime. Two out of three. That is crazy. So be very careful. Those who say, I will never get addicted to wine, you know, usually, if you are like that, you'll be among the first to fall into the trap. When we become careless, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, when we think we're standing firm, be careful. That's when we will fall. And so what's the best way to avoid becoming a drunk, a drunk card? The best way to avoid becoming a drunk card is to not start, to not start. You see, no one plans to become a drunkard. No one says, okay, one day I'm gonna become an alcoholic. I'm gonna become a no good drunk. Every alcoholic started out as an innocent kid who has never tasted a drink. You see, all addictions start the same way with the first time. Yes, alcoholic drinks do not make one an alcoholic, meaning drinking alcohol doesn't make you an alcoholic, but all alcoholics start the same way, by drinking it, by starting to taste it. So be careful, be careful, we must not be careless with wine. Being careful also applies to with whom do we drink. Don't join a group whom you know are going to get drunk. Now, if your friends insist that you do, I'm sorry to tell you, they are not your real friends. I can't forget one of our MGC New Life alumni. One time she came back to our school to talk to the graduating students. And uh, her advice to them was, when you get to college and someone asks you to drink, don't say, I can't drink. You see, when you say, I can't drink, that, that is a weak excuse. Do not say, I don't drink. Say rather, I don't drink. It's not me, okay? Th that's not who I am. That is your conviction. And that is much more powerful. Because if you say, I can't drink, they would say, why? The Bible never said you cannot drink. That's true. The Bible never said you cannot drink. But the Bible does warn us against the dangers of drinking. So it's better to say, I don't drink. Being careful also means that if I know someone will be offended by me drinking wine, then for the sake of that person, I will not use my freedom. Yes, I can drink. I'm free to drink. But for his sake or her sake, I will not use my freedom. I won't. I don't drink. Because ultimately, drinking wine is about control. This is, this is really important, and this is the next point. Okay? Not only should we not be careless with wine, secondly, we must not be controlled by wine. 
Do not be controlled by wine. Proverbs 23, verse 19 to 21 warns us we must not be controlled by it. It says, listen, my son, and be wise, and set your heart on the right path. Do not join those who drink too much, drink too much wine, or gorge themselves on meat. For drunkards and gluttons become poor, and drowsiness clots them in rags. This is the heart of the matter. Who is in control of your life? The Holy Spirit, the Spirit, or the spirits? Okay, and by that I mean the, 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 the drinks, the, song, the strong drinks, the liquors, the strong drinks. What or who is in control of your life? The Proverbs warns, warns us, those who drink too much, those who gorge themselves on meat are people without control. The issue is the amount of wine, not wine itself. Just like the issue is the amount of meat you eat, okay? It's not against eating meat. It's against eating too much. In the same way, drinking is not the problem. Drunkenness is. Eating meat is not the problem. Gluttony is. And just like wine, many things in life are addictive. We must be careful. Things such as food, even sugar, coffee, polvoron, beer, wine, hard drinks, drugs, sex, gambling, gambling, gaming, smoking, and for some people, even pain medication or even glue. These things can be abuse. It's a matter of control. Who is in control here? You know, with all forms of addiction, at first, it seems like we are making the choice. At first, we choose to smoke. Eventually, we will find that we are not in control. We rather are being controlled by smoke, by smoking. Eventually, we find that we cannot not smoke. That's the power of addiction. So do not be controlled by wine. And this reminds us of Ephesians 5, 15 to 19. Paul warns us very clearly. He says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, we do not be, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. How do you do that? Listen to this. He says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Here, the command is indisputable. Okay, no one can argue with this. Do not get drunk on wine. Okay, and, and that includes all alcoholic drinks. Do not get drunk. Rather, be filled with the Spirit. Now, we understand to be filled with the Spirit means that we allow our lives to be controlled by the Spirit. Therefore, to be drunk with wine means to be controlled by wine. In the same way as wine can control you, allow the Spirit be filled, be controlled by the Spirit. You see, when a person becomes drunk, they would do crazy things that they would normally not even think of doing. And they end up with terrible regrets. They have to live with the consequences of their actions for the rest of their life. So do not be controlled by wine. That is a strong, strong warning. So now the question is, we need to ask ourselves, how drunk is drunk? Now, I'm not talking about the legal limits set by our government. What I'm talking about is in God's sight. When do we lose control? One thing we realize, we need to know, is that today's wine is not the same as the wine in the Bible. Wine was fermented back then, yes, but not to the degree that wine is fermented today. With the invention of sugar and yeast, alcoholic drinks today are much, much more potent. And with the distillation process that was invented later on, uh, the hard drinks today, like cognac, vodka, gin, whiskey, champagne, or scotch, these are much, much more 
potent. And so if control was difficult in Bible times, it's even harder today. With the avail availability of cheap drinks and the technology for, for hard drinks, plus the social pressure and the image of drinking, it's much easier for us to lose control than ever. So again, how drunk is drunk? Research have shown that one beer impairs your mental capacity by 25%. Now, some of us will say, okay, that's, that's not too much. 25%, that's, that's, that's not too bad. But if you are driving down a small highway in the Philippines, and you're going like, say, 80 kilometers per hour, with the oncoming vehicles only two to six feet away from you, if you miss it by 25%, and the other side miss it by 25%. You know what you have on hand? You have a head-on collision waiting to happen. And hard drinks today are so powerful. They, they go up to like 40 plus percent alcohol, all the way to 96% alcohol content. Yes, there's actually a Polish-made spiritus vodka. It's 96% alcohol. It's just that much faster for us to become drunk without realizing it. We can lose control very easily. And, and this addiction applies to, this, this, this principles apply to all types of addiction. Whether it's addiction to sugar, to coffee, energy drink, Coca-Cola, smoking, uh, illegal drugs, playing games, gambling, pornography, anything that you cannot stop doing, even though you know you should stop, that's an addiction. So what should I do? What do I do if I am addicted? Well, I have a few suggestions here. What can you do to change, okay? Because change is possible. Quickly, you need to confess your sin. You need to acknowledge that it is a sin what you are doing. Pray for the Spirit to help you, for the Holy Spirit to fill you, to take control of your life. And stop it now, not later. The earlier you stop, the easier it will be. Next you see is you need to strengthen your spiritual life, your Bible reading, your devotional life, your prayer life. This have to be strengthened. Next, you need to have accountability partners, good Christian friends who will stay with you, who will remind you of your conviction. And lastly, don't give up. Don't give up. Yes, you will fall again and again, but do not give up. It will never fully go away, but it will get easier and easier. Do not give up. So do not be controlled by wine because wine is a very cruel master. And the last one we will look at is Proverbs 23, 29 to 35. Here we see the warning is, do not be captivated by wine. Do not be captivated to wine. Proverbs 23, verse 29 to 35. The, the wise man here says, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? I think we know the answer. Those who linger over wine, those who go to sample bowls of mixed wine, do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. I once asked someone who has gotten drunk several times, okay, because I don't know what it's like, but I've asked someone who, who has gotten drunk many, many times, and I asked him, how do you know when you are drunk? Do you know? He said, well, it actually is hard to tell, but he says one thing is when you drink it and you feel that the drink is so good, it is so sweet, it is good to taste, that means you're becoming drunk. Because wine is not sweet, it's bitter, it's hard to drink. When it goes down smoothly, when you like drinking it, that means you're drunk. But in the end, it says, when it goes down smoothly, in the end, it bites like a snake and it poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights and your mind will imagine confusing things. You'll be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. They hit me, you said, but I'm not hurt. They beat me, but I don't feel it. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? Friends, 
Do not be fooled by the promises of wine. Do not be enticed and be tricked into thinking that wine can give me what I am looking for. In the movies and in the popular culture, they keep telling us that we need to drink. You know, alcohol brings us pleasure. Alcohol brings us social acceptance. It brings us appealing machoism. Uh, alcohol brings us sexual appeal. And they say when you are depressed, it will make you happy. If you have nobody, it will make you into a, if you are nobody, it will make you into a somebody. If you are cold, it will make you warm. If you are not popular, it will bring you fame and bring you so many friends. Somehow, these people and the advertisements we see conveniently leaves out the real finished product. What happens in the end? What happens in the end is not what alcohol promises. Advertisement never shows us pictures of liver cirrhosis, physical abuse, people bending over, throwing up, or people becoming homeless and friendless, or entire families killed by a drunk driver. You see, alcohol lies to you. It lies to me. It mocks us by giving us false promises. Listen, do you really want friends? You want to be socially accepted? You want true freedom? You want emotional stability? You want true happiness in life? Realize that you cannot find it in alcohol. You cannot find it in the drinking crown. You can only find it when you have a right relationship with God. Everything that alcohol promises and cannot deliver can be delivered and much more to you in Jesus Christ. Only in Him, only in fellowship with His family in the New Testament local church can you find what you are looking for. Do not be so naive to be deceived by wine and its promises. Only Jesus Christ can bring you all this and more. Only He can give you the real abundant life. So do not be captivated by wine. It's fake. Do not be captivated. Do not be fooled into thinking that wine can give you what it promises. So we must be careful. We must be careful. Do not be careless with wine. Do not be controlled by wine. And do not be captivated by wine. In summary, I want to put all of this in a nutshell, okay, because we talk about so many things today. There are a few questions we will answer very quickly. Number one, is wine in the Bible real? Well, yes, it's real. It's real wine. Can Christians drink? Yes, in moderation. Is addiction to alcohol a sin? I think you know the answer. Yes, all addictions are sinful. Are wines today more addictive? Yes, they are. Much, much stronger. Should Christians drink wine? Well, think about it for a moment. Just because we can doesn't mean that we should. No one really needs to drink, okay? You, you have no need. You don't need to drink, okay? Can you drink? Yes. Should you drink? There's no need to drink. So what's the wise thing to do? Think about it for a moment. What's the wise thing to do? Knowing that it's dangerous, knowing that it's easy to drink too much, knowing the fact that modern wine and beers are much stronger than biblical time, knowing the possibility of causing offense or causing others to stumble, knowing the fact that the promises of wine are not true, it is best for Christians, I believe, to abstain from drinking alcohol. It's not that we cannot drink. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we don't need to drink. We don't need to. So why drink? Some discussion questions for you. Now, I, I know this is a very sensitive topic. So perhaps you can start with this question. With what part of today's message do you disagree? Then you have to explain, okay, what part of today's message that you disagree with. And if you can come up with Bible references, so much the better. Secondly, in light of what you have learned today, would you still drink? It's a fair question. Why or why not? And the last one, the ability to overcome any addiction can only be found in Jesus Christ. 
Do you have Him in your life? Would you want to surrender your life to Him today? I hope that you will take time to discuss these questions with your group or with your family and think about what does it mean for Christians? How do we deal with the issue of wine? And may the Lord grant you wisdom and grant you what you are looking for, the true abundant life that does not need wine to happen. All you need is to be in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for reminding us this morning what wine is and how we need to be careful with it. We must not be careless, we must not be controlled by, nor should we be captivated by wine. Help us rather to know how to control ourselves, to know how to control our bodies so that we use it for good, so that our bodies are temples that will bring you honor and glory. Lord, may you continue to speak to us. May your spirit so fill us, control us, take full control of of our minds and our hearts and our bodies that we will be fully dedicated to you so that we would honor and glorify you even in the way we eat the way we drink the way we deal with everything in our lives that we bring glory and honor to you this is our prayer in jesus mighty name we pray amen